A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. This week we are celebrating our 200th episode. So we've invited some of our favorite guests to discuss one crazy case we are all obsessed with, the very privileged and the very rich Murdoch family of South Carolina. Now, this is a family of prosecutors and attorneys who have held generational power over the criminal justice system for over a hundred years. The patriarch of that family is attorney Alec Murdoch, who is accused of killing his wife and his son, for insurance money, but he's also been charged with a long list of other crimes, alleging that he stole $8 million from his law firm, faked a roadside ambush on himself, allegedly distributed drugs. This man is facing more than 80 criminal charges. And that's not all. There are a series of mysterious deaths that have occurred around Alec Murdoch and his family, which are now being investigated again. It is a case that requires all of our experts. We are recording this on Wednesday, August 10th, 2022. Our guest today, it's an all-star lineup. We have criminal defense attorney and social justice activist, Gerald Griggs from Atlanta. Hello, Gerald. How you doing, Anna? Hey, everybody else. We have forensic neuropsychologist and wellness expert, Dr. Judy Ho. Hi, Judy. Hi, so glad to be with you guys and congratulations. Oh my gosh, thank you. And congratulations to all of you for being a part of this crime family. And then we have Allison Treasel, who is a criminal defense attorney and a legal analyst on many TV shows that you all watch. Allison, welcome. Hi, Anna. Congratulations. I cannot believe it. This is the best, best podcast there is. It is. You guys make it the best. I mean, this is just fantastic. I've known you all for years. Gerald, I've known you for a year now. You're you're the newest member of the crime family. We're so thrilled that you're with us. And I just want to let everybody know that I know Luis Bolaños is a huge fan favorite and he was supposed to be here, but he's not feeling well today. He sends his best. We miss him. So here's our dream team. So let's get to this insane case, everyone. All right. I don't even know where to begin because it's so complex. Gerald, it's got so many moving parts. And while I know that you're in Georgia, um, this is a case that is huge because of this family is so prominent. Had you heard of the Murdochs before this insanity? No, I hadn't heard of the Murdochs, but of course I heard of the case. Uh, It's very close here uh, to Georgia. And so when I heard of an attorney uh, that was interwoven into all of these different issues. It, it definitely piqued my curiosity. And then to hear about the extent of his family's legal career going back generations, uh, it, it even more uh, wanted to know more about this case. But, you know, I didn't know of the Murdoch family before, uh, but definitely, you know, learning the facts and circumstances of this case uh, is very interesting from a legal perspective, considering uh, the legal Uh, connections uh, this family has. Exactly. I mean, I think the biggest problem with all of this, Allison, was that because he came from a family of such prominent prosecutors and defense attorneys, there was always a feeling that this family could get away with anything, including murder, perhaps multiple murders. We have no idea idea here because no one (laughs) was ever not going to do anything in their favor. Well, I mean, what's incredible is, and Gerald will agree with me when I say this, this this really doesn't happen with lawyers to this extent, and especially those that are prosecutors. I mean, when you when you hear about the Murdoch family for 85 years, they were the the fox in charge of guarding the hen house. I mean, they they decided each each heir of uh, Murdoch heir decided what crimes were committed in those towns, who was going to be prosecuted, to what extent. And they they went for, for years and years, for decades, murder conviction after murder conviction. One of the Murdochs, no matter how many convictions he got overturned, he didn't care. He had the same courtroom antics 
over and over again. He would lie on the floor. One time he took a garden hose around his neck and pretended that that was the murder weapon and that he was being strangled. And even if a case got overturned, he didn't care because it was his colorful antics that kept him getting elected every single year. And this is where Gerald will agree. This is the longest running family to be elected in, in office um, for a prosecutor in U.S. history. I mean, it's unheard of. It is. It's astonishing the level of control they had. So, Judy, when you have a family that has this much power and control in a small area, and then we start to see all these mysterious deaths that we're going to get into and the murder charges and these allegations of fraud and stealing, you know, does does this kind of create a perfect environment um, for people to feel that they have, that they're untouchable? Oh, absolutely. They they for sure became more and more egotistical over time and were more and more probably narcissistic over time because of all of this power and this fame that they had accumulated. And in some ways, they know the system inside and out. And it's easier for them to cover anything up where other people might say, you know, I don't even know what to do with this if this happened to me. They know all the tips and tricks. And sometimes when you have an entire family network that is so inundated inside this system that is actually complex for most average people to understand, you almost you know, amp each other up. It's sort of like you're kind of in a shared delusional state of how much power and fame that you have and how much you think you're going to get away with. And I think that they got a little too cocky, is my opinion. It's un. Believable. Uh, we first reported on this case when there was the double homicide because it was so extraordinary. A prominent family from South Carolina, mother and son, are murdered, you know, at, on one of their properties, and there are no surveillance cameras. The father and the husband found them. It, it just was extraordinary because. You know, the the father who found them, Alec Murdoch, who is the patriarch and at the center of a lot of these alleged criminal enterprises, he he said he was visiting his father in the hospital who was dying and ends up dying a few days after the murder. So you can imagine it's like tragedy upon tragedy upon tragedy. And everyone is like, what the heck happened? Well, you know, as it turns out now, the police have decided and and I think we also are going to have to talk about this is how much did the police and investigators look the other way for a very, very, very long time? Because the murder charges didn't come down for almost a year, more than a year. And Anna, if I can say, um, it, it ultimately has come out that Alec Murdoch had this 20 year drug addiction. He is a prominent member of a law firm. How is it humanly possible that all members of that firm, most members didn't know that he was strung out on opioids for 20 years. I mean, there's no way that didn't come to light. Apparently he had stolen millions and millions of dollars from that firm. How is that possible? I think that they, I, I think they look the other way because of his last name. I think yeah, so. I mean, and you have to understand they had to know. Uh, but this family was so entrenched in the legal community that it's just one of those things that people don't talk about. I mean, when your grandfather, your great grandfather ran the law the way they did in South Carolina, you know that they knew. But the, the crux of this whole issue is that the police did probably didn't want to believe. I mean, he's been a prosecutor. His dad's been a prosecutor. His granddad's been a prosecutor. They're the ones that the police bring their cases to to determine who's going to get prosecuted. So they clearly didn't want to look that way. They wanted to believe in their hearts. There's no way he had anything to do with this. But ultimately, when they followed the facts and the law, it pointed to him. And everything started unraveling. So let's get to the most serious of the charges here, which is so 54 year old Alec Murdoch has pleaded not guilty to murdering his wife and his son. This double murder really unraveled everything else that was going on. It was like a domino. It's unbelievable as you watch it. It's so much easier for us to have that bigger picture now at this point than we did when it first happened. So on June 7th of 2021 at around 10 p.m., it's reported that Alec Murdoch discovers the bodies of his son, Paul, who's 22, and his wife, Maggie, who's 52, on the family's sprawling estate. They had a hunting lodge, everything. So Alec calls 911 to 
report that the two have been shot. We're going to play a clip of that 911 because it's very telling. His voice is very high. He's very agitated, you know, and it's very hard to read into 911 calls, but they're always very interesting. So we'll p- play a clip now. Are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and you said it's your wife and your son? My wife and my son. I think the police have asked us immediately. My wife and child shot badly. Is he moving at all, your son? I know you said that she was shot, but what about your son? <laughs> Nobody. They're not. Neither one of them's moving. What color is your house on the outside? Uh, it's white. You can't see it from the road. Okay, is it a house or a mobile home? It's a house. One of the things that stands out in the 911 call, besides the fact that his voice is so, so high, was that when the 911 operator so honestly says to him, sir, is it a home or a, or a trailer? He gets indignant and he says, it is a home. <laughs> it well, I mean, is a house. That's an question to ask in certain parts of, of the rural South. You know, you have to ask these questions, but again, if you just found your, your son and your wife, you're not worried about somebody insulting your abode. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That to me was was so telling. You know, and Judy, we will now see we're going to play more 911 tapes in a little bit. But we're going to see a theme here where when the Murdochs call 911, they're they're kind of nasty to the 911 operator. Yes, it's sort of that air of privilege that they carry with them, even in an emergency situation, as if somehow the 911 operator was beneath them somehow, that why do I have to explain anything to you? Well, they're trying to get as much information as possible to assist the situation in the fastest way possible. That is their job. And if you think about 911 operators and all the trauma that they have to go through being the 911 operators, doing what they do, handling crisis after crisis when they're at work, You would think that an average person might have a slightly little bit more compassion for them and explain things as best as possible. But it seems like obviously their priorities are completely in the wrong place. It's amazing. The 911 operator in this call and then the next one we'll play later. Both of them say to the Murdoch family members, answering my questions will not delay the response. I assure you, you know, help is on the way, but I need to know, are they bleeding? Are they breathing? Where are they? She's, you know, they're asking these very pertinent questions, (laughs) which, you know, I, I would do whatever the 911 operator asked of me, right? That's, that's me. You know, Anna, though, I have to say, and you said it from 911 calls can, can be very deceptive. And so it's, if you have to take caution if you read too much into it. So I represented a woman that was accused of killing her husband with a coffee mug. We covered that case. And one of the basis they had for believing she did it was the coolness in which she called 911 um, and that she didn't show enough emotion. Uh, she truly had nothing to do with the murder. But because they felt that she was not sincere enough or not concerned enough or not sad enough, that was one of the reasons they gave to arrest her. So we have to be careful with how we, uh, you know, how we analyze a 911 call because it, it can be deceptive. I agree. I absolutely agree. Everybody reacts differently and people handle stress in different ways. Uh, but the one theme that I have found in the 911 calls is <laughs> this sense of how dare you question me? Let's move this along, you know, <laughs> which is just, I, it's just ridiculous. It's very telling. So as we said, you know, he, his alibi, Alex, um, alibi was that he was at the hospital with his dying father who ends up dying. Now, when this happens, all of a sudden there are a ton of rumors and reports that maybe this was a vendetta killing, that maybe the Murdochs had been targeted One, because they were so powerful and they were involved in the criminal justice system, but also specifically because of the son, Paul. Paul had been involved in a tragic, fatal boating accident, and he had been charged in that, and that case was pending. And what's really weird to me is that the people who were on that boat, there were something like six people on that boat, all of them had to account for their alibis to the authorities to prove 
that it couldn't have been them? Like, why in the world would anyone suspect the other victims of a boating accident, survivors of a boating accident, to have gone after them? I mean, I I feel now that we know everything we know, it's like, who tossed that thing into the mix? What What do you think about that, Gerald? Well, you always have to be considerate of what law enforcement actually has. And I think in this case, because of their connection with the Murdoch family, they tossed a wide net in the opposite direction of possibly whatever could have happened. And that's why they were asking those questions. But yeah, I mean, in the case where you know, you're potentially the you're the victim. You shouldn't have to be answering these questions about what happened to you or where you were for another case. And you're still grieving over this case. So it doesn't make any sense. But again, given that small interwoven community that has been structured by the Murdoch's wielding of the power of the law, it makes sense that the law enforcement would go in that direction. Okay, so law enforcement, they set up a 24-hour tip line because this murder, they wanted to, you know, they wanted to solve it. They needed to know, was there, you know, killers on the loose in this, you know, kind of rural, you know, quiet. Anna, Anna, may I add something about the boating? Yeah. This this is very disturbing. Alec, when, when the son goes to the hospital and they all go to the hospital, it's reported by the police that Alec goes to various hospital rooms of the kids that are on the boat and tells them, "Do so let's get our story straight. Do not speak to the police. That That's disturbing. That, that's a very disturbing. Here is somebody that's trying to cover up the crime for his child. He knows that he was the one that drove. Um, but then he's intimidating witnesses, which is not a, which uh, as a lawyer, you cannot do. Well, and to Allison's point, they are young adults, right? So at this age, and especially given the power and and fame of who Alex is, of course you're going to be intimidated. And you're still kind of getting over that, hey, I have to listen to adults and you know do what they say. There's sort of that pressure already at that age. But on top of that, this is Alex coming to you and saying, forget it, don't do what I say, right? I am what I say, and everything that I'm telling you is more important than any authority and what they're going to instruct you to do. And this That's was a fatal, ballsy, you know, it is, it is, especially since someone has died. So Paul right. was 19 at the time. And this accident took the life of a 19 year old woman named Mallory Beach. So um, according to a lot of information that we know a lot more now than we did when this was originally investigated. This was the Murdoch boat. Everyone was underage as far as, or mostly, most of the people were underage as far as drinking goes, but surveillance cameras and um, bar cameras and convenience store cameras picked up Paul and others buying a lot of alcohol throughout the course of the night. It was later reported that Paul Murdoch, who was 19 at the time, was using his brother Buster's ID to buy all this alcohol, that he was highly intoxicated, and that when he crashed his boat into a bridge and it tossed Mallory out and she wasn't found for, you know, for days after this, Uh, everyone's looking for her body. And what's extraordinary to me is that you were all talking about, um, Allison, you were saying how Alec is going around and talking to everyone in the hospital. So one of the big issues was who was actually driving, steering the boat. And, And one of the investigators changed that, said it wasn't clear who was driving, even though everybody on that boat knew that it was Paul. Yeah. according to all court records that we've seen. So what do you make of that, Gerald? I make that they were following the the game plan that the Murdochs control power. And when you got when you have the former prosecutor telling you how to investigate a case, talking to witnesses, constructing a fact pattern that makes sense that shifts blame away from his son, they went in that direction. And so that's why it's important that law enforcement be clear of any potential conflicts and just follow Mm -hmm. the facts and follow the law. And so I think Alec knew exactly how to orchestrate uh, a fact pattern that shifted blame away from his son because they had been doing this 
for generations. They have been shaping the narrative of what the law was in that community for generations. Judy, one of the things about Paul is that according to court records, his blood alcohol level was three times the legal limit. People on the boat said that he was very um, violent. He was verbally aggressive and abusive towards others on the boat while he was recklessly, allegedly recklessly driving this boat. What does that indicate to you? Clearly, this is not somebody who is in their right state of mind. And obviously, at that point, when you're that intoxicated, your decision making goes out the window. Impulse control goes out the window. We know that alcohol does that to every single person's brain. I don't care how seasoned you think you are. I've had people tell me who struggle with alcohol abuse. Oh, but not me. I'm very, very put together when I drink and I make great decisions. No, you don't. You just think that, you know, you have this over overly confident sense of self oftentimes when you drink. And so all of these types of things are going to be part of why this went the way that it did, because there's nobody who's being responsible, especially the person who seems to be the leader of the pack. They're just, you know, completely inebriated. And this is where all of these things start going wrong. And they're not able to even in that state of mind, once the terrible things have happened to this poor victim, they're not going to be able to know what to do from there. They're not going to know how to how to reasonably follow through and, and what they're supposed to do because they're drunk. Yes, exactly. So poor Mallory is presumed dead. She's found more than a week later. And in April of 2019 is when Paul is finally indicted and charged with boating under the influence, causing Mallory's death and seriously injuring two other passengers. Paul had pleaded not guilty. Uh, Of course, many felt that the Murdoch family had gotten special treatment for Paul. And this case was pending when Paul and his mother Maggie were murdered. So that's why initially all eyes went there. And Paul's uncles, so the brothers of Alec Murdoch, this is after the Murdoch, uh, after the murders, they went on Good Morning America and they said, you know, Paul was getting all sorts of threats online um, that, th- and that's why they thought that he had, this had been a targeted killing. No, apparently not. Okay. So Let's just move along to some of the other suspicious deaths before we get into the details of the the, more on the murders and why Alec has been charged. Because I think what ended up happening is everyone starts saying, well, what about this person that died? And what about this person that died? You know, it's not just Mallory Beach. So we have uh, these unbelievable cases um, that are extraordinary to me. Okay, so uh, a few months Um, after this happens, all all these cases are coming out. So let's get to Stephen Smith, if we can. So Stephen Smith was killed in 2015, in June of 2015. This is a 19 year old young man. He was found dead on the road in Hampton County. Now he had deep gashes on his head. He died of head trauma, blunt force trauma to the head. His car was found three miles away. Supposedly, he had gone to get gas. This was the story. This is what investigators said, because he had run out of gas. He was walking back to a gas station uh, and that he was allegedly hit on the side of the road. And that's how he died. But everyone has suspected something far more sinister had happened during this time period, especially his mother. This, Allison, do you know what shocks me? This is incredible. So his mother believes that this was a hate crime because Stephen was openly gay. And she was furious because some of the investigators had noted very specific things. If he had been hit by a car, why were his shoes still on? Why weren't there any kind of rash road burns on his body? I mean, what happens to a body when you get hit on the side of the road, even if you're only going 15 miles an hour? The mother, this poor mother, by the way, and I have to tell you, I, when when we go through this entire case, my heart breaks for this mother. This happened in, in 2015. She, she was poo-pooed by everybody. Um, the coroner said, this, this doesn't look like a hit and run. Nobody listened. She said, this was a hate crime. My son was classmates with Paul. Everybody knew him. He was... He was a great kid. Why isn't anyone investigating this for the murder I know happened to him? 
Um, it's amazing, by the way, when, but when the floodgates open, they then start connecting this, this case, although she had given the investigators the Murdoch family name in 2015. He never got justice. This young man has never gotten justice. Here, here's the thing that really bugs me about this. If you run out of gas and you're going to walk to go get gas, why <coughs> would you leave your wallet in the car? Someone explain this to me. Obviously, this doesn't make any sense at all. And I'm so surprised, but maybe not surprised. Again, we talked about the power of the Murdoch family, but just even... The law enforcement, when they looked at the scene of the crime, that the first initial ruling was a hit and run for no apparent reason. It just seems so vicious in terms of what happened to this gentleman's body and how he ended up. It just seems like there's something not quite right here. And even though later on they said, yes, they spent months investigating the possibility of murder, when Stephen's mother came forward and said, hey, you should investigate this family. Why wasn't there more done at that point if there were also some people in the department contemplating, hey, maybe there is something amiss here and we need to go back and check? Why weren't they more extensively questioned or why wasn't there a full investigation of the family when somebody's coming forward and saying, I think I know somebody who might be involved in this? Judy, can I ask you, I mean, this is 2015. Um, you know, the, maybe the world's more open to it now than it was in 2000. I don't, 15, I don't know. But how much of this do you think at that time in this pretty rural Southern town was because he was gay? And and it keeps, it just, it just bothers me. I, I just, I don't know. Was it because the family was so powerful? Was it because of his uh, sexual identity? I don't know, but it bothers me. Right. Yeah. And, you know, Obviously, we don't know what it would be like to live there, but if these people had very, very conservative viewpoints as a community, this is going to be a person who probably sticks out a bit, sadly, as a sore thumb almost in this community. And I don't think that the mother was being paranoid when she said, I, I think that this might have something to do with it, because I'm sure that this young man has been dealing with this for most of his life, right? And she's seen that pain. She's seen him deal with discrimination and deal with people probably hurling insults at him and making fun of him and sometimes even more sinister things. And I think that's why she said what she said. I think you're absolutely right, Allison, that this is something that we have to think about. And we would love for, for um, us to believe that everyone is more open-minded and accepting, but they're not. And even in more city communities, <laughs> Uh, there's still people who have these ideas against people who identify as gay. And so certainly in a more rural community where there's a lot of conservative views, I think the mother is coming from a place of, I know my son, I know what he's been through, and I need you guys to look into this. This is not right. Gerald, what I don't understand is if there were dissenting, I don't know how else to put it, dissenting officers from the highway patrol who said, you know, this is not adding up. You know, we have problems with all of these issues why was then it appears to be rubber stamped as a hit and run? Why couldn't it be labeled, let's say, suspicious, unknown? I mean, there's so many other things they could have said other than this is a hit and run and we're done. Well, you have to understand, you know, the hierarchy in, in, in law enforcement. You had probably um, officers at the top that were saying, hey, listen, this is a clear hit and run. Don't investigate anymore. We can't expend any more resources on this. Uh, but the rank and file officers are like, it couldn't possibly be a hit and run. Because the story doesn't make sense. And it's always those small facts in a case that unravel the story. If you're going to get gas, you wouldn't leave, like you say, you wouldn't leave your wallet in the car. How are you going to pay for the gas? And then, again, of course, as everyone else has said, the mother is pointing you in the direction of the individual she believed did this because there's clearly a prior relationship between these two parties. He may have been one of the ones who was bullying uh, the young man for his sexuality. As everyone has said, this is a small rural community in the deep South in 2015. And so he probably had been subjected to bullying, harassment, physical violence in the past. And you know, maybe, and this is me speculating, this is, you know, allegation, maybe it was at the hands of the Murdochs. So I think the rank and file officers were, were like, you know, the facts aren't adding up, but the sergeants and the lieutenants and the chief 
say we're not going after this family without more than just a hunch. You know, it's disrespectful. And this came out at the time is that when the Maggie and Paul were murdered and the police were trying to figure out what happened and they called Stephen's mother, she thought, oh, my gosh, finally, my son's death is going to be investigated. She was so insulted when they called her to see if she could shed light on the murders of Maggie and Paul. The arrogance, the arrogance of it. Yeah. Horrific. So anyway, investigators have reopened Stephen's death. And I remain very hopeful that as long as all of those officers who dissented at the time are still holding on to their theories that maybe this can somehow be investigated and we can find out more information because it's just too suspicious a death, too suspicious. But we're not done with suspicious deaths around the Murdoch family. This is insanity. All right. Mysterious death number three. This would be the Murdoch family housekeeper. So in February of 2018, so this would be three years after Stephen dies, Gloria Satterfield, who is 57 years old, she has been the housekeeper for the Murdochs for something like 20 years. She dies after what is described as a fall at the Murdoch family home. Now, 911 tapes are going to be very interesting here. So on this 911 call, you hear Maggie and Paul talking and describing the incident to the 911 operator. Apparently, Gloria had become unresponsive after falling down a set of steps they said that were outside, that she was bleeding from the head and the ears, and it was a six-minute call, and and during the six-minute call, you can actually hear Paul getting snippy with the 911 operator. Let's play the clip. My housekeeper has fallen and her head is bleeding. I cannot get her up. Okay, you said she's fallen. She's bleeding from the head? Yes. Okay. How old is she? I'm not sure, like 58 maybe. Do you know if she fell from standing or not? No. No. Where'd she fall from? Uh, from the, uh, she fell going up the steps, up the brick steps. Okay, so she had better inside? Outside. Is she just not like responding appropriately, but she is awake? Man, she's not, no, she's not responding. Okay, I just, I, I've already got them on the way. Me asking questions does not slow them down, ma'am. Hello? Yeah, can, can you ask the patient what kind of pain she's having? Ma'am, she can't talk. Okay, do you know? She's cracked her head and there's blood on the concrete and she bleeds out of her left ear. Okay, she's bleeding out of her ear? And out of her head, she's cracked her skull. Okay, do you guys know who she is? Yes, she works for us. Okay, do you know if she's ever had a stroke or anything before? Ma'am, can you stop asking her this question? I already, have them, on the way. I already have them on the way. Me asking questions does not slow them down in any way. These are relevant questions that I have to ask for the ambulance. Once again, to me, it stands out. Listen to Paul getting so nasty with the 911 operator, stopping her and saying, Ma'am, why are you asking so many questions? This is not helping. What do you do with that, Judy? I mean, look, this is so interesting because as I'm thinking about this and thinking about what the 911 operator might be thinking also and what might have been in their minds as they're talking to the 911 operators, it's almost like, hey, we're giving you all the facts. Why do you need more from us? And it shows you a little bit of how they have been treated with such reverence in their community, right? It's like, I don't understand why you're asking me for for more information. Everything I said is fact and you don't need more than what I'm telling you. Why don't you get it? Why don't you follow along? I mean, it's that sort of attitude that doesn't just come out of nowhere. And he's a teenager, Judy. He's a teenager. It's one thing for for Maggie Murdoch maybe to take that attitude because she's an adult. But this kid, he's a kid. Right. But that shows you what kind of lessons that essentially has been circulating in this entire family. Right. I mean, there's been that that sense of entitlement, probably, that was communicated to these children since they were little. And I think this is why 
this is why the 911 call went down the way that it did. And I know that everybody deals with stressful situations differently, but to essentially question the 911 operator for why they're asking more questions, that's a very interesting turn that you might take in a situation where essentially you're supposed to be the person who provides information and answers questions, but no, they're kind of turning it around and saying, well, no, I, I have a question for why you're asking me this question. I mean, this is just a really, really uh, telling about the kind of family values that have been circulating. It's, it's craziness. And this is in the middle of a crisis. And, right. you know, Allison, the, the thing about this is Maggie, as she's describing this woman who has worked for you for 20 years, this woman who has raised your children, you know, right? There's no way she didn't raise those babies. That the way she's like, oh, well, she's mumbling. Well, is she alert? No, I don't think so. Is she talking? Well, she's mumbling with with such, I don't know, disdain and disconnection. Anna, this woman was so close to their family that in at her funeral service, okay, she is described as um, th though th the the Murdochs as part of her loving family that she leaves behind her sons, you know, her spouse, and and the Murdochs as part of her loving family. I mean that that's how close she perceived the Murdochs to be. Two decades she raised those boys. I am astonished at, at at the voice. Like I would like be doing whatever I could to help someone who had been such a part of my family and helped me raise my children. I mean, that is like the, the most important thing, gift any human being can, can give to another person, another parent. So here's, this was recently revealed. Okay, and this to me is is among the most despicable things I've heard. And I know we're hearing a lot of despicable things about this family. Allison, you brought up the funeral. Let's go to the funeral. Okay, so this woman is finally being put to rest. And according to court records, Alec went to Gloria's sons and said to them, look, this happened on my property. So ultimately, I know I'm responsible. Um, I want to help you out. I think you should file a claim against my insurance company. And I, I give you my word, you know, I'll do everything I can to make sure that indeed that the insurance company pays you out. And as a result of that, I'm going to help you up and set you up with some friends of mine that'll help you navigate this. And, and I want to make it right. Okay, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And we're all kind of in agreement. It's like, oh, okay, he's 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 trying to kind of do a good thing until <laughs> until it is alleged that when Alec arranged for a payout of four point three million dollars, and you know about half of it went to attorney's fees, but that the sons would then be owed two point three million dollars. So, all right, the fact that you know, more than $2 million goes to attorney fees makes you realize, wait a minute, th this, th this wasn't about helping the sons. This was about making money off of her death through attorney's fees. Gerald, help me with this. <laughs> the red flag should have gone up. When he started talking about, I'm going to make sure you guys are taken care of and I'm going to refer you to a few people that can help you out. You should red flags should go up. These are his friends. Some kind of way he's going to profit from this. But again, in a town where the law flows through this family, no one thought, oh, this might not be a good idea for me to use his lawyers to help sue him to get a beneficial payout from him and his insurance company. So clearly the red flag should have gone up and to do this at the funeral. I mean, they're putting their mother to rest. I mean, how cold hearted could you possibly be to think about leveraging a death into money while they're putting her in the ground? I'm speechless. I'm speechless about this. And so, any, yeah. any time someone says, go ahead and sue me, they're in on the take. They are in on the dick. There is no, nobody says, you know what, just go ahead and sue me. The guy you referred to him to was his college classmate, okay, and a dear friend of his. And I, I'm sure we'll get into what happened with all of the money. But I mean, a takeaway of all of this is nobody, nobody who's not doing something corrupt, doing something wrong, tells you to sue them. Yes. 
Exactly. Red flags. So the thing is, apparently the sons didn't know that the money had ever been paid out. So this $4.3 million, again, according to court records, because now the sons are suing the estate of Maggie and Paul and what's ever left of Alex, you just sue everybody, understandably so, and anybody else who who helped with this scheme, um, because they didn't even know that the money had ever been paid out. And so where did the money go? It's a very complicated series of accounts and companies, but the allegation is that pretty much the money went to Alec Murdoch. I mean, I don't know. It's a pretty complicated scheme, but I mean, what do you, what, what do you all make of this? Well, this is somebody who knows the system inside and out and essentially knew exactly how to work the system. And like everybody has said already, this is high suspicion, red flags. He's referring you to the old system that he works in for generations and their family to, to get your due, right? And who, I don't care how confident you are, who says, go ahead and sue me, but that shows, <laughs> that shows the bravado, right, of, of, of this person. Basically, I was saying, hey, go ahead. I, I expect it to work out for me. And not only do I expect it to work out for me, I expect to make some money from it, is essentially what's, what's really beneath all that. But what really strikes me is the way in which he executes all of these different types of events, as we've been talking about this entire podcast so far. Uh, this is somebody who has absolutely no empathy, um, probably has a pretty good idea of how to feign empathy, look like you're a compassionate person when you're really not. And everyone thinks, oh my gosh, this person's so generous, they're so well-spoken, they're amazing. But that is part of what people put on when they want to get something from it. It's essentially all of this is really put on as a means to an end, right? Mm -hmm. And this is somebody who has gone away with so much that essentially over time, you get better and better at essentially executing these types of traits that in the world of psychology, we sometimes refer to as psychopathic traits, right? Like this very, very possible in this individual where essentially over time, they get more and more confidence because they have gotten away with more. And th this makes them more and more of a better criminal because people have not checked them. So those are the three mysterious deaths. And so that's the background. And now I want to get back chronologically to how things are unraveling because three months after the murders of Maggie and Paul, like crazy stuff starts happening. Like Alec is, is literally unraveling, unraveling. Okay. So let's go to September 3rd, 2021. This is just last year. Alec's law firm, which he is a partner in, asks him to resign because their own investigation allegedly revealed that he had stolen millions from the firm and from clients. The law firm then notified the authorities to do an investigation, but none of this is public yet. This is the best part. This is why this is so interesting. This is not public. The very next day, the very next day, this does make the news. We're all like, oh my God, what's going on? On September 4th, 2021, Alec Murdoch claims that he shot in the head while changing a tire in Hampton County. Remember the same place where poor Stephen has been, where he died. Alec is hospitalized, he's airlifted, he's conscious, and police say immediately, but it was just a grazing bullet. Well, you're laughing, Allison. <laughs> I have to tell you, we covered the story. <laughs> we covered that on that day, we did like a wall to wall thing. And immediately I said, oh, well, he set this up. No one gets shot in the head and it's a it's a small flesh wound. I mean, no shot in the head. And it's it was just grazed his head and it the and how it, it was. It was a setup. It was a setup from the start. And it was like. Oh my goodness, there's so many layers here. Gerald, do you agree with me? I mean, I, I definitely agree. You know, having, uh, you know, practiced criminal law for 19 years and dealt with, you know, gunshots and murders, that's the first thing you think of. It's like, wow, you got shot in the head and you lived? <laughs> um, yeah, something's wrong there. Either the person is a really bad aim or it's a setup. And you can tell it was because he felt the walls closing in. You know, it's just like the, the doctor just said, if he has, uh, allegedly, this type of psychosis, you start to realize, OK, I, they're starting to catch on. My law firm is catching on. I wasn't as successful as my my grandfather and my father. 
at the practice. So I've been stealing for this long, this long yeah. period of time. And now they're finding out about my thefts. I got to figure out a way out of this. So let me set up a crime. And you know what really gets me too is that then a couple of days later, he announces that he's resigning from his law firm and that he's entering rehab. I mean, there are people who are truly suffering from addiction, okay, and really truly need rehab. It is not a convenient excuse for you to get away from your problems. And that is what I'm afraid of when I look at this is like, people are gonna think that everybody who goes and enters rehab when their life is falling apart is just making things up and that this is just a way for them to get away. And that's not true because there's actual people who are suffering and truly need treatment. And this is part of why mental health stigma still exists because we have a few bad people manipulating the system. And when things start closing in, like Gerald said, He's saying, what's my escape? Oh, okay, good. I'll say I need to go to rehab because then people will have empathy for me. Right. Uh, Dr. Judy, if it makes you feel any better, when we covered it, we went like, okay, give me a break, dude. I mean, uh, really, really, you're you're the person of interest in a double homicide. The, you clearly have just set up your own murder where, or your own suicide where you're shot in the head. And um, and you're going to do a small stint in rehab. Like, don't get comfortable there because you're headed to jail soon. So if it makes you feel any better, nobody believed it. And <laughs> and this is what I love about um, all the people who listen and watch, because um, we did an update that day, too, because the news was so incredible. It's like, oh, my gosh, is there someone really gunning for the Murdoch family? So many of you said, hold on a second. <clears throat> a man this rich, a man this privileged would never change his own tire oh, so good. <laughs> on the so side good. of the road. That's so good. It's you all are so smart. The people on the internet that point out the important details. And that's why we love them so much because, that's you right. know, as lawyers, sometimes we get inside our own head. But then you go online and you see a comment. It's like, yeah, that makes sense. And then you start right. investigating. So kudos to the people for pointing that out. <laughs> yeah, like get back to the basics. This is not a person who's going to say, you know what, I'm going to do everything myself because he's he has things done for him. This is a person who's going to call. I mean, everybody has AAA, right? It yes. is not that bit of extravagant of a thing. It's like, hey, I'll just call somebody from AAA. They'll be here in 20 minutes to change my tire and I can just sit and hang out in my car, right? Why would you exactly. get out of the car to change your tire when you're Alex Murdoch? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Or he probably has OnStar some type of service where they will bring the people out there to you. They probably give you a whole new car while they fix the car. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Love it. It's true. Love it. Okay. So now everyone is really fixated on the case chronologically because now the events are like insane. We've heard about three mysterious deaths that are being reinvestigated. We have two people dead, you know, a mother and a son. We have this weird thing on the side of the road, which looks obviously staged, but we don't know. Was it a suicide? Was it a murder? Turns out, according to the authorities, they allege that Alec had conspired with one of his cousins, Curtis Smith, and that he wanted Curtis to kill him, to kill Alec, so the one surviving son, Buster, could get $10 million in insurance money. Is that- Scamming to the end. Scamming to the end. <laughs> it's like- craziest plot ever oh and anna not only is um curtis smith a distant cousin he's also a former defendant which alec represented and he according to authorities was a known drug dealer so there's that and a really bad shot <laughs> yes <laughs> Oh, well, Curtis, Curtis tells police, no, 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 Alec put the gun to his head and I wrestled the gun out of him because I didn't want him to kill himself. Now, that's entirely possible, too. <laughs> but I don't know which to believe here because they're both crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like something was being plotted because there's no reason for the two of them to be on the side of the road. Exactly. So something was going on. Right. You know, whether whoever was supposed to pull the trigger, I don't know. But you're right, Gerald, in a terrible shot at that. OK, so, of course, as we know, Alec has now entered rehab. And at the same time that he's in rehab, his 
former law firm is now publicly telling everyone what they suspect has been going on financially. So there's another investigation, a legal investigation into that. It's incredible. Finally, Alex's law license is suspended. I know that seems like a really minor thing, but again, it's like it's all being piled on him. So Judy, I'm thinking at this point, now that you've got his cousin who's been charged with this um, craziness on the side of the road, he's lost his law license. Now everybody knows, okay, now that the public knows that he is suspected of scamming so much money from his law firm, you got to think that now the whole world is like, ooh, this Alec is a bad guy, meaning he's up to no good. So from his point of view, what's going on? I mean, is he seems like he's unraveling. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is a man who has believed in his whole life and probably for the most part has been true is that he's been in control of everything, you know, no matter what, no matter how big the other person is in terms of their own fame and achievement, he's always been able to best them. And I think that it is that sort of cockiness that led him to where he was eventually, because you start to think that you're going to get away with everything and you start being less and less careful about the crimes that you commit and the scams that you try to incite. And I think at this point, he doesn't know how to deal with his life because this is completely new territory to him. You know, everybody's on to him. There's no good explanation that anyone's going to believe. And I don't think he knows what to do because he has never had had to cope with a situation like this. Mm-hmm. And so he probably is unraveling. And I think it, it, he's probably just grasping at straws at this point. It's like, I don't even know what to do. It's almost like the person would revert to almost their childhood and start to act like a child um, because they don't know how to take on these problems and to deal with them in a way, because this is essentially something that's been building up his entire life. Right. Yeah. So I think that at this point, it's almost like he has the mindset of a child. Like, I, I don't know, like, take this away from me, please. Right. Like, I can't. Somebody save me. You know, so he, from rehab, he gets arrested immediately and then he gets extradited back to South Carolina to deal with all these charges that are emerging. I mean, it's it's everything is is hitting him left and right. And he's never going to get bail on this one. So just back to the cousin, because I know, Allison, this is a really big deal. So the the Curtis Smith, who's 61, is arrested in connection with the shooting of Alec Murdoch, um, but he's he's charged with assisted suicide, assault and battery, uh, pointing and presenting a firearm, insurance fraud, and conspiracy to commit insurance fraud. And then it gets a little bit more complicated because then the authorities allege <laughs> that Alec um, did confess that the shooting was a setup, right? Um, because he wanted to get the insurance money. And then apparently Curtis starts unraveling. Um, and then and then the authorities claim that these two had been for years operating some kind of an oxycodone. Drug ring. <laughs> Drug ring. Thank you. I'd- yeah. No, I mean, it's incredible. And it goes back to, by the way, what people knew or should have known. I mean, Alec Murdoch, who is this fancy pantsy lawyer who has, you know, they have this prestigious law firm, is also moonlighting as like a drug kingpin in this small town. And it's shocking. How did nobody know this? I know that people were were aware they were buying, uh, allegedly, they were citizens of this rural town are buying oxy from Alec Murdoch, their lawyer. I mean, it's just, and family of the prosecutor. I mean, it's like the land of the bizarro. (laughs) And some of these companies there, I mean, there are allegations and all of this has got to, you know, I don't know how they're going to figure this out, but it appears that, you know, this money was being funneled through a bunch of different other companies. And there could have been some crossover between the poor housekeepers insurance money, the oxycodone money. All of this is still to be determined. How well, it's, it's like a criminal enterprise. It's like the mafia here. I mean, look, the, I, the, in addition to um, the poor kid that, that was uh, left on the side of the road, I, I feel so badly for the housekeeper's family 
who didn't know anything that he had stolen all their money to feel to, to you know to fuel his drug addiction to keep his drug empire going to live continue to live his lifestyle with that that ranch that he owned um, and these people learned about a settlement of millions of dollars in the news in the news yeah it's 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 unbelievable um so you know more and more charges are coming out. As we've said, there's something like 80 charges here and there are various people. There's Curtis and some others. <clears throat> it gets very complicated after a while, and we've only got so much for this podcast. But so Alex and Curtis then get indicted on that assisted suicide, attempted murder, ambush craziness. Then finally, uh, on May 31st, uh, someone, I, I realize you're, you're criminal attorneys, but apparently Alex signs a confession of judgment awarding Gloria Satterfield, the, the housekeeper's family, over $4.3 million. Three days later on June 3rd, South Carolina law enforcement announced that they plan to exhume Gloria's body to see if there were if there was any foul play in there. So what does that mean that he signs a confession of judgment? Does that mean that the that he's saying yes, they should have gotten the 4.3 million, so give it to them? I mean, I have a feeling some insurance companies are going to have a thing to say about this. I don't know, Gerald. I'm I'm turning it to you. Maybe it's a southern thing. I've never heard of yeah, that. Yeah, that might just be a South Carolina thing. <laughs> I've never heard about that. But it sounds like what he's saying is that uh, he's confessing that something was awry in this judgment, and so he's admitting uh, it's an admission against interest. And he's admitting that he took the, that money and they need to get that money back, which of course signaled the law enforcement that something bad had happened, and that's why they're exhuming the body. But again, that that's a South Carolina thing. You know, Georgia, we don't have anything like that. So I'm not sure. But that's my that's my uh, educated guess on that. So you have that going on. So now there's four point three hanging in the balance. And again, we don't know if not only the government, but insurance companies are going to say, hold on a second. You know, this was all fraudulently done and arranged. Therefore, we want that money back. And they're exhuming Gloria's body. Let's figure out what did she really die of? Because they never did an autopsy. They just said that it was natural. But many have questioned, well, if she tripped and fell, like they say, then wouldn't it be an accidental death? Um, again, power. We have no idea. We don't know what the truth is. And don't forget that there's also Mallory Beach, who died in the boating accident, and two others who were injured. So Mallory's family had originally filed a lawsuit against uh, the Murdoch family in addition to the criminal case. But now um, there is yet a new case, a new lawsuit, and this is asking $65 million against the estate of Maggie and Paul, again, for Mallory Beach's death and for the two who were injured. So now they have to decide all of this. What is unclear to me is how much is this Murdoch family worth? I don't know, because right now I see money going out the door and I and he's got a defense. And if he's allegedly killing people or trying to kill himself for insurance money, that tells me there's no money there. At least not not in his name. I mean, I don't see how any of these people in jail. I mean, you can you can correct me, but I don't know how any of these people get to other Murdoch money. Um, you know, the brothers, they didn't have anything to do with this. I don't know how you touch any of that. I mean, unless as a partner, he's stealing from clients out of those attorney tri client trust accounts, you probably can claw back money from the firm that way. But in terms of these civil suits or wrongful death suits, I don't know how you go after any, any other Murdochs. It doesn't seem to me that they had anything to do with it. Yeah, I think the families are, are up the creek without a paddle. He clearly was out of money. He clearly concocted these schemes to continue to live his lifestyle, allegedly. And, um, you know, I, I don't see a, a pathway to recovery. Um, like you said, possibly um, you could go after the firm if you can prove um, that he uh, was still in client money. Uh, but then there's probably going to be a wall there because the, the firm probably didn't know. So you'd be only entitled to the money that he had. And, and so um, it's probably real problematic for them. And this is why he probably tried to fake his own death to make sure his kids, one kid Buster, take care of while he's gone. So uh, they have to unravel this complete scheme. And the only one that knows the truth uh, is Mr. Murdoch. Mm -hmm. Now, 
It's a year after Maggie and Paul are murdered that Alec is finally charged with their murders. So now everyone's like, okay, so at what point did police honestly suspect him? And if he really did kill his wife and his child, I, 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 I want to pose this question to you. I do believe, based on all of this, that Alec Murdoch is definitely capable of a lot of hideous, horrible things. But is he capable of killing his wife and his son? And if so, why leave Buster alive? Somebody? Judy. <laughs> Good point. I mean, but at the same time, we know that if there was some kind of issue or conflict with certain family members, there could be a motive for Alex to say, I, I, you know, and again, sometimes it might even be in the heat of the moment, right? When we see these kinds of murders being com committed against family members. And yet once it happens, I mean, it's done. So you have to do everything that you can to pretend that you were not the person involved. So if he really truly did kill his wife and one of his children, it could have been that there was some kind of conflict there with these particular family members. Who knows, there could have been a moment where he had absolutely no impulse control. It could have been something that sometimes people call a crime of passion, right? But he's clearly not in his right mind towards the end of all of this. And so if there was any kind of paranoia against certain members of the family, that could have been a possibility. And also even with people who don't have these types of concerns and this type of bravado or even possibly a mental illness we don't know but it's possible you have favorites you know you have favorites in the family so mm -hmm. it's also possible that buster was his favorite and to be honest once you have been involved allegedly in multiple murders and multiple scams your your level for what's a problem and something that you can't actually focus on and deal with on an emotional level, it just keeps rising. So it's almost like every single crime just deadens you a little bit more and you lose more and more compassion. So eventually you could potentially kill a family member and emotionally maybe not even grieve them that much. That is absolutely possible. And we've seen it in other murders. Dr. Judy, we're gonna leave on that note. We know that you have another commitment. We thank you for joining us on our anniversary episode. We're gonna wrap up uh, because there's still a few more parts to this case. We thank you for your insight and we're so thrilled that you're a part of our crime family. Oh, thank you so much. And we could talk about this all day. There's just so many layers. It's absolutely my honor to be with you all. And thank you so much for having me, Anna. Congratulations on your 200th episode. And it was great to hear your insights, Gerald and Allison. One of the things that you have to take into consideration, if you believe the allegations that the state has made, he was running a criminal enterprise to sell narcotics. He had killed multiple people and scammed multiple people out of millions of dollars. So at this point, he's operating with a truly alleged criminal mind. So nothing is outside of the realm of possibility. And what could have happened was his wife had found out the things that he was doing yeah. and confronted him. Allegedly, he could have killed his wife. And then the son came in. And of course, now you got a witness to a murder. So you got to kill him, too. So, I mean, those are some things that possibly could have happened. It's just me speculating in 19 years of listening to cases. Stuff starts happening when things start unraveling, especially when people discover that you're allegedly a criminal kingpin with bodies and money and drugs everywhere. Nothing's outside the realm of possibility. And Anna, can I add to that? Look, I, I, I don't know enough. And not There's not been enough information released to the public as to the actual facts and circumstances to lead the police, not to just suspect that he murdered the, his wife and his son, not to just make him a person of interest, but why after that one year did they actually arrest him? Because it's not enough that, that he is involved in all this other nonsense, um, you know, Yes, it, this doesn't make him look like a good guy, but it doesn't point to him being a murderer either. So there's got to be something there that I don't think the public has been privy to. OK, but when you ask the question, I, I agree with 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 a lot of what Jared said when it's, you know, look, the, I think the wife probably discovered it, confronted him. Um, 
But this child of his, this this younger child, this has been a problem of his for a long time. Okay, mm -hmm. so he's got this boating. He's he's been charged with this boating crime. He then gets sued for his family money for a lot, a lot of money, and. Um, he may have felt that the that the best way to solve the problems related to his son was to get rid of him. If in fact he did it, if in fact he did it, um, I can see. You know, Buster's never given me any trouble. Buster, um, you know, I want to make sure he's well taken care of. But somehow he's able to sort of compartmentalize that. Yes, they may, may both be my sons, but one one I've got to dispose of, and the other one I've got to take care of. Um, uh, and so I, I, I think that when you do look at this history of the things that he's been willing to do and get away with, um, it is possible that he did it. It is possible. We just don't have enough information. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Is not it, enough. Very much like organized crime again. You know, you just eliminate problems. Um, there's not a lot on Buster, but the Wall Street Journal did report that Buster was allegedly kicked out of law school for plagiarism. So I'm just saying... This is a family. <laughs> this is a family that seems to have a playbook. But, you know, obviously Buster's not charged in any of this. Now, one thing that did happen, so he's entered his plea. He says he's not guilty. He says he wants a speedy trial because he wants authorities to get out there and find the real killer or killers. I'm feeling like that's from the OJ playbook. You know, it's like, okay, you know, we'll find the real killers. Here's something that happened in court, thank goodness it didn't go through, that really upset me. So um, it was introduced to court that there should be a gag order. And not only did the defense think that there should be a gag order, but the prosecutor supported it. And, and both sides actually thought, well, and maybe we should even seal some records in order to get, um, you know, in, in order to preserve information and not taint the jury pool for the double homicide case. Thank goodness, the judge said, are you crazy? He didn't say that, but I'm sure he was thinking that. <laughs> yeah, and it's said, a matter no of public way. interest. This yes. is a matter of public interest. And I want full transparency here. Yeah. I e extreme public interest because yeah. of the cloud that's around all of this. So yeah, I, I see where the judge is going with this. It's so much out there at this point. Just pile some more of the stuff on. Right. I mean, and I don't think that the judge made this ruling because the judge found this to be a salacious case and the judge wanted the media attention. I think this judge understood the much broader implications here that we, they want to make sure that the public knows that there's not corruption in this case. Yeah. And and uh, one of the reporters made a comment that in the in the courtroom that it's being heard, there is actually like a portrait of one of the Murdochs. <laughs> 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 Wait, can I just circle uh. back for a second? Anna, I've never heard, I've never heard of a family, uh, I mean, a family with nearly a century old legacy of being the prosecutors. And, and then they have this guy who's going around. I mean, he's like the terror of the town. It's like the most <laughs> amazing thing I've ever seen. It really is. Yeah, well, it's going to be real difficult picking a jury that doesn't know this family or have some connection to the family, uh, you know, and, and can be fair and impartial. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've never heard of a family this entrenched into the practice that, you know, you're going to be in a courtroom with a picture of your grandfather <laughs> uh, hanging over in the corner while you're being tried. That That's got to be interesting to say the least yeah there's no way they're going to find a fair jury and anywhere within a hundred miles of this case i mean there i i think that there's going to be a change of venue i think yeah. that um i mean it seems that this judge thus far has has done you know their best to to make sure that this is transparent and fair but i don't even know if you have a judge that's a local judge hearing this case i don't know yeah, I think it's got to be moved. There has to be a change of yeah. venue specifically for the murder case, I think. Maybe the other stuff can be handled locally. I have no idea. But it, we just thought that this was such an enormous case and so much has happened in the more than year since the murders that it really needed a full storytelling. And we'll keep everyone updated, not on every little thing. And local reporters there are doing an amazing job of, of reporting this case. So you've got many avenues. Um, 
Um, you know, we're not going to do comments today on our special anniversary. Um, we're just going to have one little update. You know, I, I talk about how occasionally our reporting can make a difference in life. And about a year ago, we did two podcasts on um, sexual abuse in um, Amish communities. This, these are closed religious groups um, that, you know, very peaceful, peace-loving, nonviolent, but prosecutors and police don't like to get involved when religion is involved. And, and we did some powerful podcasts and there's been some changes as a result of it. Louis uh, Bolaños, who could not join us today, um, really has worked hard in this area. And I just wanted to share something that happened this weekend to just leave everybody with a little bit of hope. This is about an organization called the Amish Rescue Mission. This is a tiny little 501c3 nonprofit that literally just tries to help women and children trying to get out of abusive relationships and get them into safe places. They erected a billboard this weekend in Ohio, like an old fashioned Amish barn raising, the way they pulled it up. We're going to show you the video. And it's a billboard that basically reminds children, this was placed near an Amish school that tells little children places that are not okay to be touched and that they have rights. And maybe in the main scheme of all of the crimes in the world that we all report on, subjected to in our communities, I do believe at the end of the day, these crimes happen in communities, they affect real people. And when there are these small magical changes, I believe it's important to support them. And that's why I love this podcast. So we're showing you that video and I just wanted to share that with you because I do have a sense of optimism. And Allison and, and Gerald, I know that you share an optimism because you wouldn't be as active as you are in, in the areas of justice because I just see it in you and the things that you do. Look, I, I, am, I am very proud to have been a criminal defense attorney for 25 years. And the main reason why is this. I've represented some bad people who've done bad things, but I've also represented innocent people. And um, the, to me, there is no greater crime on earth than incarcerating someone for decades who is innocent. And so the fact that I've been able to play a very small role in making sure that innocent people don't get wrongly convicted, that's the that's the greatest um, like joy and um, my biggest accomplishment. So that that's sort of, I think we're all in this to see that justice is carried out, It's but it's carried out fairly and honorably and honestly. Absolutely. And, you know, the reason why I became an attorney is to make sure that individuals' rights are protected. You know, I've been blessed to be involved in some of the biggest cases in Georgia history, biggest cases in the world. Um, but the main focus is just taking one case at a time, listening to the client, making sure they get their fair day in court. You know, like like she just said, I've represented a lot of people. Some of them were innocent. Some of them were guilty. Uh, but, you know, they got the best representation I could possibly give them. And, you know, what I want to do with the practice is to make people understand that people determine what justice is. The law is based on the application of facts and evidence to the law based on the judgment of that community. And so that's why it's so important we bring these stories about what's happening in your community, how you can get involved, how you can make sure justice is fair and balanced, and then ultimately leave it to you and your discretion on what American justice is going to look like. And so it's just an honor and privilege to be on the show to talk about, you know, all the things that are going on in the practice and, and, and in the pursuit of justice and to remind the people that we make the decision. You know, you may not like what's happening in your community right now. You may allege that crime is high. Serve on a jury. You may think that police involved situations are not fair. Serve on a jury. You may think that the entire system is broken, where well, there's one way to fix it, that's to serve on a jury. So we're just asking you to do your civic duty, get involved, and let's get some justice. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I, that's why I love this podcast, because it's so interactive. So many of you, you know, that Amish case that I was referring to, that, that podcast got more than a million views on, on YouTube because you all were so outraged and your voices mattered because we organized in a way. We did. We got involved. And I do believe that the community voices can make a difference. And that is why silence 
is honestly our biggest enemy in everything. Silence. Silence and hiding everything. So that's why I love this podcast. And that's why I want to share some great news, not only 200th episode, but we've been nominated for a People's Choice Award for Best Crime Podcast. Woo-hoo! We're honored. We, we all have done this together, our tiny little producing team, all you wonderful guests. And as I always call you, you're part of the crime family. This is so interactive. Before we go, I want to give a shout out to some of our most loyal fans who have been with us for years on YouTube. (laughs) We've gotten through the pandemic with them. So a quick (laughs) shout out to all of you. And if I missed your name, I am really sorry because there's so many of you. But I just want to say thank you to Candy Gaylor, Tiffany Sadler, Barbara T, Mary Scott, Scott, Pamela H., Sarah Gray, and Josephine Peary. Thank you all for being so loyal and supportive. We are a great family here. And um, I thank you, Gerald, and I thank you, Allison. It's been such a privilege to, to, to get to know both of you. Anna, you, um, you know, I've known, I knew you before this podcast. We were on other shows together, and you've you've done such a beautiful job spotlighting these cases and bringing them to people's attention and then really trying to get out there and, and, um, and help victims and bring justice to the world. And I love you for that. You're just the best. Thank you. And thank you, Gerald. So where can people find out about all the amazing things that y'all are working on? Gerald, where can people find you? Well, you can find me on all social media at attorney Griggs on social media, uh, and just, you know, on the internet, www.geraldagriggs.com. Uh, but Anna, I just want to congratulate you. 200 episodes. This is a wonderful podcast. I thoroughly enjoy being on the podcast with all the guests, all the stories. And uh, I wish you 2,000 more episodes. Get engaged. People, y'all need to share this podcast with all of your family, all of your friends. And let's make sure we bring home that award. Oh, thank you so much, Gerald. And by the way, I've had a a little bottle over here of Prosecco. The team has sent out a bottle of Prosecco to all of you to celebrate. Obviously, we can't be drinking at 10 a.m. when we're recording. (laughs) But it's just a little thank you because we appreciate you. Allison, where can people find you? So I'm a criminal defense attorney in Los Angeles. Allison Treasel is my name. I work for KTLA, which is a Los Angeles station. I also work for Access Hollywood, um, and I do a segment with Mario Lopez on um, interesting criminal cases going on around the country. That's why you always know. We we never have to give you any background, even though we do, because you just like you always know the cases. You're always on top of it. You well, look, find- the case you picked today is just, I mean, it's the case. It's the case. It's, I don't even, no words. It's the case. It is the case. Y'all can find me at Anna G News, Anna with uh, one N. Also, big news, we're finally on TikTok. So find us on TikTok. I'm on TikTok, except instead of an S at the end of Anna G News, it's a Z, long explanation, la, 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 la. I was taken, whatever. (laughs) But nonetheless, you can find all our episodes wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, sign up to receive our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. Until next time, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime.